thank you, Dr. Dorsella, for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor, and uh, I appreciate your words. And I really appreciate the great hospitality uh, I always meet in uh, India. Uh, so today, I have been asked by uh, Dr. Servanas to prepare this talk. And uh, I think he was uh, uh, right to choose this topic uh, because uh, provocative test in uh, video nystagmography, which is a cornerstone for vestibular testing, uh, they are important. And there are some tips which are not written in the text box and uh, uh, frequently not highlighted in the talks or workshops. So uh, why we do provocative tests? Uh, we, we need a uh, provocative test either to reveal a pathology or to reveal a latent unilateral, unilateral vestibular dysfunction. All of us are aware that is if we have a unilateral vestibular hypofunction due to neuritis or due to any other condition, it's uh, uh, physiologically, physiological compensation will happen and uh, uh, the spontaneous nystagmus and the many other signs would disappear clinically and even with the video nystagmography. So sometimes uh, only they present uh, like with the very fast head movements, the patient will be symptomatic. Uh, so you need some provocation to show if there is a latent vestibular hypofunction. So what kind of provocation uh, methods we use? We use uh, certain positions uh, like the dexual bike test. Uh, we, we use gaze changes to see uh, the effect of gaze on, uh, uh, on nystagmus. Uh, we do heat shaking, we do some pressure testing, we do uh, sound stimulation and see if it can provoke uh, nystagmus or no. Uh, we use vibration, we do hyperventilation, we do caloric stimulation, and uh, lately uh, it comes to uh, the literature, the magnetic stimulation. Uh, and if you don't know, the vestibular system is the organ which sends uh, the magnetism. And um, actually, one of my Ukrainian friends, uh, Professor Konstantin uh, Turians, he, he wrote a book a chapter on uh, magnetic uh, stimulation of the vestibular system, maybe more than 10 years ago. But recently, especially the John Hopkins group led by Professor David Z, they started doing research on the effect of magnetic stimulation on the vestibular uh, system, and they have uh, uh, some publications. So, so we'll go through each one of these provocative tests. You cannot do everything for each patient. So we have to tailor. Most of you work in busy clinics, and even uh, you have the time, the patient, we don't have to expose the patient to all the testing. That's exhausting and uh, time consuming and sometimes boring to the patient. So you have to tailor which test you choose or subtest you choose during the video nystagmography based on the clinical history. So if I have a history very suggestive of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, most of the time I go directly. And I choose, I ask him if which side you feel the symptoms more. If you told me the right side, I, I test usually uh, the uh, symptomatic side first. So always try to go to the uh, point. Uh, so, uh, uh, the sequence also, the clinical history should be considered for the sequence of video nystagmography. And uh, usually we start by looking for spontaneous nystagmus with and without fixation. Why spontaneous nystagmus? Once you found the spontaneous nystagmus, that means vestibular asymmetry. It could be peripheral, it could be central, but you have a very clear sign that there is some sort of vestibular asymmetry. So the first thing we, uh, thing we look for is the presence or absence of a spontaneous nystagmus. The second, uh, we look for gaze evoked nystagmus with and without uh, fixation. And we will talk uh, in details about the gaze uh, testing. Um, heat shaking in nystagmus, because that's uh, um, uh, uh, easy to, to do, to perform a test which can uh, reveal any hidden or any latent vestibular asymmetry. Uh, 
Hyperventilation-induced nystagmus, we'll talk in details. Pressure and sound-induced nystagmus. So uh, one of the important points, actually, in uh, video nystagmography is the effect of gaze on the presence or in the degree of nystagmus. Uh, you, all of you heard about Alexander's law, which usually describes uh, the vestibular nystagmus. Because looking uh, to the direction or directing the gaze to the direction of the first phase of nystagmus usually uh, provokes or enhances the nystagmus. And looking far away or to the opposite side of the uh, first phase of nystagmus reduces the nystagmus. So keep this in mind because this is very important. Uh, there is important clinical point during all the vi video nystagmography recording, always try to keep the pupil in the mid position, in the central gaze, because if the patient is looking to the right, they will have sometimes this end point physiological nystagmus, is the gaze evoked nystagmus will show. So during the positional testing, or during the caloric testing, during many, many, most try always the optimal condition to record accurately is to keep the pupil in the mid position and the gaze to uh, the uh, center. Unless you uh, intentionally want to see the effect of gaze. And I give you a secret. <laughs> Just whenever you have a doubtful nystagmus, you have in a certain position, you have a few uh, beats of weak right beating nystagmus. So what you do to, to get sure if it's a real nystagmus or what? Simply uh, ask the patient to look to the right. So asking the patient to, in the same position just to direct the gaze to the right, that really makes the nystagmus clear. So if you have some, you don't know this is some saccadic oscillations or it's a real nystagmus, just ask the patient to direct the gaze to uh, the direction of the first phase. If it's a true nystagmus, it will become more robust and more clear. So the effective gaze is very important. And the concept should be clear. I made a table and I uh, prepared it specifically for this workshop, just the concept of the gaze evoked nystagmus. I can see a spontaneous nystagmus, yes. This is spontaneous nystagmus get stronger when I ask my subject or the test is subject to look towards the direction of the first phase. This is understood. I might have a least degree of spontaneous nystagmus, which is called first degree. So only in the central position or in the neutral position, uh, the patient uh, doesn't show spontaneous nystagmus. But when he looks to uh, a certain gaze, he got he got some uh, beats of nystagmus. So the first degree of, nyst of, of spontaneous nystagmus, you will see only uh, if the patient directed the gaze in the neutral position towards the direction of the first phase. Then you might see in many different uh, other positions. Let me to ask you, um, do you have a clear definition of what's called spontaneous nystagmus? And I will follow uh, Dr. Manoj's uh, approach. We need some reaction. Do you have a clear definition for what you can describe as a spontaneous nystagmus? Yes, sir. Nystagmus which appears without any provocation. Perfect. But in which positions? One line I would like to put it that way. Yeah. We're talking about provocation tests in... Uh, no, no, no. I mean what is the spontaneous nystagmus? So that is that comes unprovoked. That's perfect, but uh, comes where or when? Without changing the direction of the gaze, without any position change, without anything. That's correct, but let me to add something. Spontaneous nystagmus is the nystagmus you see in the neutral position. Okay, but still you can have a spontaneous nystagmus which is not in the neutral position with the central gaze. A spontaneous nystagmus called for any nystagmus which you see the same nystagmus with the same direction in more than five positions. So in more than five positions. Because if you follow the natural history of the vestibular compensation, the spontaneous nystagmus in the neutral and central gaze will disappear first. So the third degree spontaneous nystagmus will become like uh, uh, second degree, then it will become first degree only if looking to the gaze. After some time, 
in the neutral position, it will disappear. It can just remain like in, in many different positions. So during the Dixwell bike, during the head right, head left, you can see. But it should be of the same direction in five positions. And it should be not changing its direction at all. And should be not changing its direction at all. So this is what we call spontaneous stagnancy. Okay? If it changes its direction in one position, it's not a spontaneous nystagmus. This is, can occur with the, uh, with the lateral canal uh, cobulostasis or lateral canal apogeotropic forms. Uh, you have what's called pseudo-spontaneous nystagmus. So what is the difference between pseudo-spontaneous nystagmus and spontaneous nystagmus? In pseudo-spontaneous nystagmus, you will find one position uh, which the nystagmus disappears or it changes or reverse its direction. But the spontaneous nystagmus is a nystagmus which is seen in more than five positions, and it doesn't change its direction. Uh, okay. So this is I made. The, this is for you to make. So when I look for uh, nystagmus with the gaze, so first, if I have a spontaneous nystagmus, I will see that in the uh, same in the central uh, gaze, and I see it in the right, and I see I see it in the left gaze but with the same direction. So this is a spontaneous nystagmus. I could see a spontaneous nystagmus in the center, or I could uh, uh, see it continue to be either in the left or on the right, but when it, uh, uh, in one of the gaze, it reverses its direction. I know most of, the, of all of you know from the books what's called the bronze nystagmus. You know what's bronze nystagmus? Yes, perfect. So what is bronze nystagmus? So the patient has in the neutral position a spontaneous nystagmus. Then in one side, he, he has the same spontaneous nystagmus with uh, uh, low amplitude and more frequency uh, in that gaze. But on the opposite side, he will have the gaze evoked central cerebellar uh, generated nystagmus. So um, he has a spontaneous nystagmus in the middle. Uh, he has the same spontaneous nystagmus in one of the side, but in the opposite side, the nystagmus, it changes its direction. Okay. Third possibility, which is the gasparitic nystagmus, which can occur as the, a side effect of the medication. It can occur with central disorders, cerebellar disorders, where in the center, no nystagmus. But when you ask the subject to look to the right, uh, they will show a right beating in nystagmus. When look to the left, left beating in nystagmus. This is due to the um, uh, integrator uh, deficiency, and this is the, or what's called gaze baritic nystagmus. Problem in the central integrator of the gaze. The, the system is unable to keep the eye fixed in a certain gaze. Okay, so we have three possibilities. You have the spontaneous nystagmus, same direction in all the gaze conditions. You have spontaneous nystagmus with superimposed central component uh, uh, with uh, uh, beating in the opposite direction. Uh, and you have the gaze evoked nystagmus or the gaze baritic nystagmus, nothing in the central gaze, but only when looking to the right or looking to the left. Uh, heat shaking nystagmus. Uh, another test, um, most of you, you know how to do, and we can show this in the hands on uh, session. Uh, you do heat shaking, one to two hertz uh, frequency for 20 times or 30 times. Actually, to be effective, it should be vigorous. But uh, doing a, a vigorous heat shaking is not safe in elderly, not safe with those with uh, like uh, retinal detachment or intraocular lens. Uh, not safe with too much osteoporosis or neck problems. So just uh, choose the patient who can do vigorous head shaking. But to be more sensitive, it should be a little vigorous. So what, can, uh, what kind of finding we can see with the uh, head shaking? You do the shaking, then you look for nystagmus. So it's either present or absent. So if it's positive, the test, you will see nystagmus. So what are the possibilities of nystagmus we can see first? You can see a monophysic horizontal nystagmus, which is like a nystagmus beating in uh, right or left uh, direction. So what it does mean? Head shaking is a peripheral or a central. If you have a post head shaking and nystagmus, is it peripheral or central? Answer. 
We don't know. Okay. It's non, non localizing, non specific. It means there is vestibular asymmetry. This vestibular asymmetry can be on the peripheral level or can be on the central level. So just having a positive uh, postage shaking doesn't mean anything. Doesn't, it does mean only there is some vestibular asymmetry which can be peripheral or can be central. This is for if you have a monophysic, which means nystagmus in the same direction, just right beating or left beating. So what, what if we, uh, after the head shaking, you find the up beating or down beating nystagmus? Central, yes. And uh, what is the most common central vestibular disorder? What else? What is the most common central vestibular disorder? Migraine. Migraine. Migraine is a neurological disease, and it's a central disease. So the most common central vestibular disorder is migraine, and you can see different central finding in migraine as patients. So if you see uh, after heat shaking vertical, uh, up beating or down beating, that's a central uh, of central origin. So what else? We have what's called biphasic after head shaking in nystagmus. So after the head shake, you have nystagmus, right beating. Then after some time, uh, uh, just reverse its direction. Okay, so we called it biphasic after head shaking in nystagmus. And it can occur with uh, central, with vestibular schwannoma. It can occur with peripheral uh, disorders, with vestibular adaptation. Uh, and I will share with you one case. This is a young Egyptian uh, colleague. Uh, he's really very smart, and uh, um, he diagnosed very nice case and sent me the traces. His name is Mahmoud Shaban, and I'm really proud. He uses the Cyclops, and uh, he's uh, getting excellent records and uh, really diagnosed many uh, difficult cases. And this is from his uh, traces. He sent me the video. But unfortunately, sending through the emails, the quality of the video not good. But if you look to the, uh, after heat shaking, he found this biphasic, uh, biphasic uh, nystagmus. So at the beginning, it was, after the heat shake, it was right beating. Then after a few seconds, it turned to become left beating nystagmus. So we ordered MRI, and the MRI shows uh, left vestibular schwannoma. So if you have... Uh, biphasic after heat shaking in nystagmus, it will be worthy to get MRI imaging uh, because it can occur with central disorders or with vestibular schwannoma. And this case was a case of vestibular schwannoma. And it was uh, a left vestibular schwannoma. Hyperventilation test. How many of you do hyperventilation test? Perfect. Quite very good number. So how you do? Yes, Dr. Sandeep. How you do the hyperventilation test? We ask the patient to hyperventilate for one minute. OK. And then uh, we put our divisor and ask him to focus at one point. Perfect. That's, that's, that's very good. Uh, I found very nice uh, article from uh, Luigi Califano, uh, one of uh, our good Italian friends and one of the active members in our Facebook uh, group. He wrote a very good article on hyperventilation test. I recommend it for you. So uh, hyperventilation test is meant to reveal any lesion which causes uh, its nerve uh, demyelination, such as the schwannoma, vascular compression lobe, and multiple sclerosis. So the technique he recommended is to do in the sitting position quick and deep respiratory uh, cycles for 70 seconds. But yes, as the Dr. Sandeep said, one minute is OK. We do one minute as well. So what is the uh, physiology behind? Hyperventilation will cause washout of the carbon dioxide, leading to hypocabinia and respiratory alkalosis with hypocalcemia. And it affects the calcium channel ionic gates. And the hyperventilation increases the neural activities in the demyelinated nerve fibers, the end organs, and the cerebellum. Hyperventilation could change intracranial and perilymphatic pressure. So it can work either to increase the excitability in the demyelinated structures, either the nerve or the uh, cerebellum, uh, or it can work through 
changing the intracranial pressure. So sometimes the hyperventilation test will provoke uh, an stigmas uh, originated from a dehiscent superior canal or from a perilymphatic fistula as uh, well. So it's uh, in uh, Califano study, they found that it was positive in 21% uh, of the vestibular patient, which really is a quite uh, high uh, percentage. Uh, and the appearance of nystagmus or a change in existing nystagmus, either it enhance or suppress. And for the presence of nystagmus, he put a very good definition uh, that uh, you have at least five degree nystagmus for five seconds within one minute after the hyperventilation. Um, it's, it's, it's a very logic uh, definition. Sometimes we accept uh, the nystagmus to be of less than five degree, especially if the patient is symptomatic. So most of the literature they put like four, five, and four, uh, or the minimal uh, slow phase velocity for nystagmus to be clinically significant. But honestly, in some clinical cases, we consider nystagmus of three degree or four degree uh, to be clinically significant, especially if the patient is symptomatic. But uh, it's as a start point, or uh, it's, it's a very reliable definition. So what positive hyperventilation test? It can occur with vestibular schwannoma, can occur with vascular completion rope, uh, vestibular neuritis, multiple sclerosis, vestibular migraine, lymphatic fistula, and decayary malformation or cerebellar degenerations. So uh, let me to ask this. Uh, a hyperventilation test can help you to differentiate between psychogenic dizziness and organic dizziness. How how is that? Yes. It does help. How? So basically, these patients who are uh, uh, supposed to be uh, suffering from, say, functional dizziness. Now, these patients do hyperventilate during those panic attacks. Now, if we can simulate that situation and we get an nystagmus, I think that helps. No, no. Of an anxiety. And the part of the dizziness or psychogenic uh, dizziness explained the bar the, by uh, presence of hyper chronic hyperventilation. Uh, and you will find that those sometimes complain that when they exercise or go to the gym or walk for a distance, they start to feel dizzy. But the main thing that if there is hyperventilation induced in stigmas, that's organic. And if there is uh, subjective feeling of dizziness after the hyperventilation, but without nystagmus, that could be psychogenic. Okay? So this is how it's used. So for uh, psychogenic cases, no nystagmus. If you find nystagmus, that means it's organic. But if the patient experiences, you know, that is the same dizziness I feel, that is the same feeling I feel during the attacks, but without nystagmus, this is may point to uh, being of psychogenic origin. Good. Fistula test. Uh, what's your experience with fistula test? How uh, common uh, you find it positive in suspected cases of uh, perilymphatic fistula? Mm. This side, any? Pretty rare. Just to share your experience. So it's pretty rare, very rare. Very rare, yes. A uh, positive? positive. I have. Ah. I have noticed in little semicircular canal fistulas due to cholesterol Yes. And also. But I mean, how uh, it's a sensitivity? Like you suspect a case of having a very lymphatic fistula, then you in do. Su in superior semicircular canal fistula, only by uh, that uh, sound. It is sound induced is positive. I have seen in two or three cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, uh, in our experience and the experience of other colleagues uh, in different parts of the world, yes, Dr. Manoj. Uh, I think of these fistula test is the bony labyrinth and we have the membranous labyrinth. Yes. If the bony labyrinth is breached, chances are that fistula test will not be positive. Mm. But if the membranous labyrinth has been breached by the disease, the fistula test has a higher chance of being positive. Yeah, but clinically, overall, how sensitive you find that? That's test? what I'm saying. That clinically, 
most of the cases, it's only the bony labyrinth that gets breached, and mm. therefore the sensitivity is low. Okay. In very few cases, is the membranous labyrinth breached, and there the fistula test is not only positive; it's positive to the extent that the patient actually can cry out that stop doing this to me, something of that. I sort. fully agree with you. So overall, it's actually of low sensitivity. Part of uh, uh, because of the pathology, like Dr. Manoj, he explained if there is affection of the pony labyrinth or only or just as a membranous labyrinth. And part because it really needs a more pressure change to be induced. So usually trigger pressure. Don't exclude the diagnosis of very lymphatic first lab because when you do uh, trigger pressure, it didn't provoke nystagmus. Sometimes it needs really, it needs a more stronger uh, pressure. And uh, one of my American colleagues is really, what you know, he, he asks the patient to like to do same like squatting position with excessive straining. And uh, that's the only way they, he, they could uh, provoke the nystagmus. So this is what's written in the box, like trigger pressure, pneumatic otoscopy, and the tympanometry. For tympanometry, the best way to do with tympanometry is to use a manual tympanometry. Some even uh, computerized system now, they have the option to run it as manual. And you have to keep the pressure like for 20 seconds. So for it uh, to work. Uh, another one, he did this nice. Uh, uh, I put for you the link for a nice uh, uh, video on the YouTube. with really just little pre trigger pressure. They show uh, very robust uh, nystagmus. But in my experience, it's, uh, uh, it's of low sensitivity, and it needs excessive pressure to be provoked. And uh, it's not uncommon that very lymphatic fistula just presented with a position induced in nystagmus. Uh, this is some modification. He put the tympanometry tip in the tube uh, with this uh, air pump just to generate uh, more pressure with a sealed uh, end. So it's just the concept that uh, negative fistula test, uh, not enough to exclude the diagnosis of perilymphatic fistula or a third window syndrome uh, because of the pathology, because of the efficiency of the pressure uh, induced. If you want uh, uh, to improve the sensitivity, use more pressure. Uh, Valsalva test, um, there is two types of Valsalva test. It can be uh, against the closed nostril, blowing the middle ears, uh, or against the closed glottis, like straining, lifting a heavy object, which increases the intracranial uh, pressure. And here a link for a video. So what conditions can uh, you expect to have positive Valsalva test? Uh, superior canal dehiscence, very lymphatic fistula, and Arnold Kayari malformations. So let me to ask you, what would be the direction of nystagmus in superior canal dehiscence? With Valsalva test uh, plowing the nose. Uh, direction of nystagmus, I mean. Mm. Vertical torsional, yes, it will be down beating with the uh, uh, valsalva with closed nostril, and it can reverse if you do valsalva with closed uh, glottis. So, in Arnold Carey malformation, what would be the direction of nystagmus? Down beating, always down beating in nystagmus, and uh, but it doesn't uh, change. So, always down beating in nystagmus in Arnold Carey malformation. Very lymphatic fistula. Horizontal nystagmus. And more common, it's more common to be from lateral canal origin. I, in my clinical experience, really, I didn't. Uh, it's more common to be horizontal. It could be definitely theoretically from uh, a posterior canal or from superior canal, but in clinically, most of the cases they are uh, because of lateral canal very uh, lymphatic fistula, which usually generates. Uh, uh, horizontal nystagmus. Okay, just to show the different mechanism of uh, both the valsalva or the pressure changes, it's almost work in the same uh, way how sound can uh, provoke or induce nystagmus. 
So for sound induced nystagmus, what you do if you clubbing, I use the clubbing. Any other ideas? You use the audiometer. What kind of uh, stimulus and that we, at which level you do? 250. It has to be a low frequency, high amplitude sound. Yeah, that makes it a mix of vibration and sound. Good. I have a proven case, video of everything. A doctor, superior family circular canal digestion. 250 negative, 500 negative, 1000 width of the response, 2 kilohertz. He gets huge new segments along with all. That's interesting. That's interesting. Sound is different than vibration. So uh, uh, they didn't specify a specific uh, frequency. Uh, for me, clinically, I use the clubbing. Uh, I bought the Barani box, noise box, but actually, even myself, I didn't see. Uh, but any, any kind of uh, sound generator. Personally, I use the clubbing, yes. Vibration induced nystagmus, or what's gaining popularity and called Dumas test, who's a French uh, scientist and uh, uh, one of our colleagues works with him. Dr. Solara is supposed to come, but unfortunately, she has some difficulties. She couldn't come. So uh, uh, it uses a vibration. Uh, in the literature, you find that this vibrator has been uh, used on the sternomastoid then have been used in the mastoid, uh, vertex, uh, mastoid right and left. So uh, uh, the idea behind the vibration induced nystagmus, it's again to reveal uh, a unilateral hypofunction. And uh, he uses uh, 60 or 100 hertz uh, uh, vibrator. He uses 60 hertz or 100 hertz uh, frequency vibrator applied to the mastoid tip or the vertex or the sternocleidomastoid mass. Uh, and it could be positive in superior canal dehiscence where it induces torsional nystagmus. It could be positive in unilateral vestibular hypofunction. It's considered a high frequency VOR test. Uh, it can induce vertical nystagmus in central uh, disorders. So. Uh, sometimes you read what's called uh, vestibulogram or um, what's called like vestibular testing in the frequency domain uh, because we have the caloric very low uh, frequency test. We have the rotary chair, we have the video head impulse. Uh, then we have this vibration induced uh, test which is uh, 60 hertz or 100 hertz uh, frequency test. So uh, you, you can test the vestibular system on different frequencies. Uh, positional testing, I think that's important. You will find static, dynamic, positional, positioning. I hate these terms. I didn't find it of any clinical value. It just confuses the uh, juniors, and um, it has no meaning for me. I always prefer to use dix bike test. It's a well-described test with a very definitive uh, procedure. I use McClure-Bagnini test instead of uh, Subain roll or uh, Hediau or uh, why? Because uh, for lateral canal BBV, the test is called Subain roll. Actually, the movement, it's not in the roll plane. The roll plane is like this. So actually, it would be like the Hediau, Hediau test. So because of this uh, inaccurate name, I prefer the name uh, of the uh, two doctors or two scientists who uh, invented the test, uh, McClure and Bagnini. So McClure Bagnini test, and it's uh, uh, written in this way in the Cyclops software. Uh, other position can be used as straight head hanging or straight head extension test. Side lying test, which is uh, uh, um, sometimes it's called the Seamont uh, diagnostic test, or it's some modification for uh, uh, the positional testing for anterior and posterior canal 
especially for those with back problems or neck problems. And uh, the bow uh, and lean test or showing, uh, showing test. So uh, I like um, to name the uh, positional testing with the names, uh, such names, because it's very clearly described. You know what kind of position, you know. But when you say positioning, positional, and all this one, I found them confusing and they're not really of help. Uh, definitely, positional testing may be the most uh, important provocative test, and I will share with you some clinical hints. So the Dixwell bike test is the test of the posterior and the anterior canal, uh, BBV, uh, and the horizontal canal, BBV. How many of you sometimes uh, see the uh, nystagmus of horizontal canal, BBV, in Dixwell bike? Good. So quite good number of the audience, they agree that the horizontal canal nystagmus uh, appear in the Dixwell bike. And this is because of the orientation of the horizontal canal. Honestly, the horizontal canal orientation allow its nystagmus to be uh, provoked with most of the positions. So usually most of the position, even uh, sitting in the neutral position, it's sometimes if you have a horizontal canal BBV, it can show what's called pseudo-spontaneous nystagmus. Um, Leaning backward, bowing, uh, head extension, dexual bike, head right, head left, all of these positions can stimulate the BBV of the horizontal canal. Uh, so that's why it's important to look for the uh, direction of nystagmus. Uh, BBV should be diagnosed based on the direction of nystagmus, not the provoking maneuver. Benign paroxysmal position at vertigo should be diagnosed based on the direction of nystagmus rather than the provocative uh, position. Because as you see that the horizontal canal can show up in most of the different positional uh, tests. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Dixwell bike test, you will find in the literature what's called uh, vertebral artery screening test. Uh, it's of low sensitivity and low specificity, but it's sometimes uh, uh, done. Uh, for me, uh, Dixwell bike test is some sort also uh, of vertebral artery screening test. Because what you do, you do extension and torsion. You do extension and torsion to the neck. So if you imagine if a patient he has a vertebral buzzer insufficiency or he has absent uh, one of the vertebral arteries or atherosclerotic one with narrowing, uh, sometimes it provokes an nystagmus and provokes a dizziness in this position. And in my experience that most of those cases we labeled finally as a case of vertebral basal sufficiency, uh, the nystagmus is always horizontal and we have explanation for this. And in uh, like uh, positional testing, they show uh, a nystagmus which it does not change the direction. Uh, because simply they found that either kinking of the vertebral arteries will decrease the uh, blood flow or stretching as well. So you don't know um, uh, when you put a, a tested subject in the Dixwell bike test, they do a kinking of the vertebral artery in one side and they do stretch of the vertebral artery in the other side. And the either kinking or stretch, it can uh, compromise the blood flow. Uh, monitoring of nystagmus at the three steps is a good idea. That's put in Cyclops. If you go to for the Dixwell bike, so first sitting with the head 45, uh, then uh, the head so buying, then uh, uh, sitting. Uh, so it's a, it's a good idea. Sometimes it's uh, time consuming, but sometimes it shows a reversal phase. Sometimes it shows if you have uh, um, like initial nystagmus before doing, uh, bringing the head down. So in Dixwell Bayek, uh, uh, this to summarize, if you have a right posterior canal BBV, so on the right side, so always upbeating torsional nystagmus. Sometimes you see in the other side an inhibitory uh, component uh, with a down beating nystagmus, weak down beating. But not, it's not a must, but sometimes you see. 
Uh, for left posterior canal, you will find on the left dorsal bite up beating torsional and on the right uh, weak down beating. Uh, for the right anterior canal BBV, you will find anterior canal, like if you put the patient in the right dorsal bike. So which anterior canal you are uh, testing? Correct, yes. So it's a LARP and RALP. LARP and RALP. So always like uh, left anterior canal BBV will be more symptomatic in the right dexual bike. And the right anterior canal BBV, BBV will be more symptomatic in the left dexual bike. So just keep this in your mind. Uh, so just uh, this is a summary for uh, the uh, vertical canal BBV finding in the dexual bike test. Okay, apogeotropic or common cross PBV. Yesterday, Dr. Sandeep was talking in the dinner about that he's uh, now uh, seeing more cases uh, of apogeotropic posterior canal. So simply, uh, apogeotropic, geotropic, or uh, posterior arm, anterior arm, canal is a very clear concept with the lateral canal BBV. Uh, but the same principle can simply be applied on the posterior canal. So I do believe in its existence. Uh, it shows like a, uh, sometimes like a down beating nystagmus on the dexual bike test with up beating torsional nystagmus on setting. But I see also uh, the common cross variant of BBV. Uh, they put here, it's uh, in the uh, abogeotropic, uh, the uh, autoconia, the blue one. Yeah, this one. But what happened? Sometimes you have the autoconia here in the common cross. Just think, if the autoconia in the common cross, what kind of nystagmus do you expect to see? Yes. Yeah, purely torsional. And simply why? Because... Uh, posterior canal will cause upbeating torsional. Anterior canal, because it, it will do stimulation for both the anterior and the posterior canal. So you have simultaneous stimulation of the anterior and the posterior canal. So posterior canal, upbeating torsional. Anterior canal, down beating torsional. So the up and the down will cancel each other. You have a dual component of torsional nystagmus. So that's why you have intense torsional nystagmus. We, we, we have a, a good number of recording of this very, very, very strong torsional nystagmus, which is suspect of the common cross. Yes. Same, but sometimes you need to do uh, the maneuvers more brisk, just more brisk maneuvers you do. Uh, we'll talk about this later. Can I ask a question at this yes. point, sir? So if it is in the common cross, the autoconia are in the common cross. Now, when you're doing a dick solpike, isn't there a possibility of these autoconia falling into either the anterior canal or the posterior canal? And if they actually fall, because normally we wait for a while and we give it one minute in each position. So in the head hanging position, isn't there a possibility of the autoconia going into any one of the canals and producing a There is possibility, but yeah. anatomically, anatomically, yeah. it's very hard to go to the anterior canal. So to produce and if it happened and went to the anterior canal, it will be easy to spontaneously come back by the effect of yeah. gravity. Just a suggestion, sir. Just a suggestion came to my mind. Uh, sometimes patients complain, well, when you take them back, there's no nystagmus, no problem, but when they get up, they have nystagmus yes. as, can this be the, this variant? Yes, especially for the apogeotropic posterior canal. Yes, it's called the uh, uh, sitting up uh, positional, it has a name, I think a Turkish uh, uh, researcher who published, uh, but this is uh, published and reported, very well reported. So uh, mainly they have the symptoms, not when lying down, but when um, simply, why? Because uh, in the regular type, um, putting the patient dexual bike will cause a stimulation. And you know, it was second law. 
that is a stimulation, semicircular canals they respond more for the stimulation than the inhibition. Uh, but if it's on the apogee trophic, because simply, if the autoconia is here, when you put the patient in the dexual bike, there will be uh, endolymph flow in this direction. So this is will be uh, inhibitory in this time, inhibitory stimulation or in inhibition. So always the semicircular canals, they are very optimistic. Physiologically, they respond to the stimulation much more than the inhibition. So this is could be uh, explanation. So to summarize, in Dixwell back test, uh, just uh, some tips. Uh, uh, common cross canal sizes uh, can show with very strong torsional nystagmus. Abogetropic posterior canal uh, BBV provoke down beating nystagmus in head down position with upbeating reversal phase. A strong nystagmus usually followed by reversal phase in the same position. If you have sometimes those with very, very, very strong uh, uh, positional nystagmus from uh, posterior canal, at the end of the upbeating torsional, just you have few beats of down beating. As a rule, any kind of strong vestibular nystagmus, it's commonly followed by uh, 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 few, uh, a few beats in the other direction. There is different explanation because of the uh, strong deflection of the cobulas and it comes back. There is a vestibular adaptation mechanism or something. So whatever, but uh, don't get surprised that the nystagmus after being very strong upbeating, it uh, turn it for a few beats to be uh, down beating nystagmus. Uh, strong nystagmus usually followed by reversal nystagmus on the other side of the dexual bike. Uh, I will, it's very important. Your examination will not be complete until you examine the other side. Because really I got very, uh, uh, very interesting recording that you, like you have very strong down beating nystagmus. Uh, uh, from one side, but when you bring the patient to the other side, you have more, more, more stronger upbeating nystagmus. So it changed uh, your interpretation of the test. So hold the final interpretation until you test the other side. Mixed canal BBV. We have, I think maybe you have the largest series, but we don't have time to uh, publish a lot. Uh, but for the multiple canal, really, we have a huge number of cases. So we observed that simply when you have a mixed canal uh, BBV, uh, what happened? It's always uh, like uh, if posterior canal and horizontal canal. So the posterior canal component will take over initially, upbeating, upbeating, torsion, upbeating, torsion. Then after it subsides, the horizontal component. Theoretically, the nystagmus should be the sum like oblique or something, but in reality, this is why I have uh, constantly observed it that no, what happened is that is the vertical component always takes over at beginning, then after 30 or 40 seconds, the horizontal become, component become uh, more thin. It's important, we'll discuss this in the coming slides. When you do uh, positional testing, you wait, wait, don't rush. You wait and see uh, what happened at the end of nystagmus or when the nystagmus ends. Duration of nystagmus is an important parameter. So you have to be patient and wait until it uh, ends. Horizontal canal nystagmus, Peter seen in McClure Bagnini test. Even if you dexal bike, go again and do the McClure Bagnini test. Uh, we observe it in some cases that it changes the direction. So you, you don't know it's a geotropic or abogetropic type. So it's always for horizontal canals better to do the mcclure bagnini test. Arnold K. malformation, it always present by persistent down beating nystagmus, which it does not reverse. Vertebrobuzzer insufficiency, in our experience, usual unidirectional horizontal nystagmus and dexual bike test at both sides. Either kink or stretch of vertebral arteries can provoke the symptoms and the nystagmus. McClure Bagnini test, which uh, test uh, meant to examine or to look for horizontal canal BBV. So you have uh, geotropic and abogeotropic. 
And here, let me to highlight, because that's confusing in the literature and sometimes in the textbook. So let me to ask you first, so what is geotropic and nabogeotropic for you? Just to share your thoughts. We are here to share our thoughts. Yes. Okay. No, no, clinically, when you label this is a geotropic nystagmus or this is abogeotropic nystagmus. Because simply, if you have a spontaneous right beating nystagmus, when you put the head uh, to the right, that's a geotropic uh, nystagmus. So to make it clear, don't use geotropic, abogeotropic, except if you have a biphasic, bipositional nystagmus. So don't try to use this terminology at all, except if you have a horizontal canal BBV of geotropic or abogeotropic. Because I cannot, if, if I have unidirectional nystagmus, I cannot say geotropic or abogeotropic. It's actually, it's one direction nystagmus. So when you put it uh, uh, in the same side, it's geotropic and the opposite side. Of the so don't use this term. It's the only condition which you use the term geotropic or abogeotropic, if you have a patient, when he turns the head to the right, he has a right beating in stigmas. When you turn the head to the left, he has left beating in stigmas or the opposite. When you turn the head to the right, he has left beating. When you turn the head to the left, he has right beating. So it's a bi-directional and bi-positional nystagmus. You get the point? Because to prove it's a geotropic or abogeotropic, you need those two positions. One position is not enough. So it's, I have been through the literature and text books. Everything is sometimes confusing. So the only condition we can use geotropic or abogeotropic, if you have a BBV or, uh, or a similar condition uh, to the horizontal canal BBV, uh, with an stigmas which it changes its direction from bringing the head to the right uh, uh, after bringing the head uh, to, to the left. Because one, uh, if the nystagmus is toward the ground in one position, not enough to say geotropic. At least you have that nystagmus keeps looking to the ground in head right and head left. Otherwise, don't use, it will be confusing. Uh, yes, in McClure Bagnini test or positional testing, sometimes you see a unidirectional nystagmus, like uh, left beating or right beating. It doesn't reverse. Uh, geotropic or algebraic, the nystagmus should be reversing its direction from left to the right. But sometimes you see a nystagmus only in one side which it is not, uh, is not uh, reversing. We have seen this like in uh, very lymphatic fistula, in vascular compression loop, uh, vertebral basal insufficiency migraine, uh, central cases, and the vestibular schwannoma. And let me to ask you any, any kind of explanation. Why like if you have a vascular loop? Why uh, or you have a vestibular schwannoma? Why it only shows nystagmus uh, in a certain position? Uh, simply, you have explanation? Yeah, because of compression of the uh, vestibular nerve. In certain positions, there is kinking of the nerve because of tumor or any pathology, and that reduces the conduction through and causes, uh, simulates acute unilateral vestibulopathy for transiently during that position. It's good, but the main factor is the gravity orientation. Gravity orientation. Because if you have a vascular lobe or you have a mass, its weight, pressuring uh, on the nerve or the blood supply uh, can uh, change the degree of uh, uh, compromise by changing the gravity orientation. So that's why in certain positions, um, the gravity will uh, lead these conditions, the vascular lobe or the mass, uh, do more compression in this position. So it's a matter of gravity orientation. Uh, geotropic or geotropic only for bidirectional, bipositional, reversible nystagmus. Uh, latent uh, spontaneous nystagmus can show on positional test. Uh, take care of this direction. We mentioned this before. If you want to enhance a weak nystagmus, use Alexander Law. So, uh, yes, another tip horizontal canal BBV versus uh, central nystagmus. 
geotropic type, it's more commonly to be uh, of peripheral origin, but there is cases uh, where it shows to be of central origin. Abogeotropic type, uh, there is more opportunity uh, or more chance to be of central origin than the geotropic type. Uh, so what kind of parameters you can use to know it's either peripheral or central? First, uh, the duration of nystagmus. We read in the box, uh, transient, persistent, uh, prolonged. So what's your cutoff uh, point? for the duration of nystagmus? Two minutes. Else? Three minutes. Okay, four minutes. <laughs> I will use the Professor Asperal Libonati, uh, a great Italian uh, professor. Really, he put four minutes as a cutoff point for uh, nystagmus. So if the nystagmus lasts more than four minutes, um, it's most likely not of uh, BBV origin. You have to think about other causes. So I use personally the four minutes. Yes, you have to be patient, and I put the patient in the position, and yes, we record four minutes. So if the nystagmus lasts more than four minutes, it's most likely to be of BBV origin. You think about other differential diagnosis. It could be because of migraine, because of light cobula, heavy cobula, or other central causes. But personally, I use the four minutes. Uh, it's more conservative, four minutes uh, duration. Crescendo, decrescendo. So what's crescendo, decrescendo? Crescendo, decrescendo, it's a uh, uh, long time uh, described the characters of BBV nystagmus. So it's very fast. Uh, reach its peak very fast, then gradually uh, calm down. So very uh, high slope in uh, increasing, then slowly decreasing. Uh, um, this is very clear in the posterior canal, less evident in the horizontal canal BBV, but really it's a good sign. So if you have an stigma which it's a very fast peeled its uh, velocity, then gradually decrease, that goes with the PBV origin. But if you have an nystagmus, since the beginning it has the same intensity, same velocity, same, which it is not a changing, that's most likely not a PBV. Okay? So uh, the duration and the crescendo, decrescendo character, and the most important, most important, they respond to repositioning maneuvers. So finally, if you do the maneuver two, three times without a response, whatever you see, just ask for MRI or uh, search for uh, other causes. Heat hanging test, it uh, might better show down beating in stigmas. It can differentiate bilateral from uh, unilateral posterior canal BBV uh, because theoretically, if you put in the heat hanging, if you have a patient with bilateral posterior canal BBV, uh, so uh, the torsional component from each side will cancel each other, and you have a purely vertical uh, up-eating component uh, uh, with the head is in the central head hanging uh, position. Uh, be cautious with the recent stroke vertebral basal sufficiency because the worst uh, is to do head extension. This is maybe the worst position which compromises the vertebrobasilar flow. Um, a heat hanging test, it can be another way to do the bow and uh, lean test. Bow and lean test, it's very nice sometimes, like last week I have a patient on a wheelchair, very hard to bring in the bed. So we tested uh, for a horizontal canal, uh, we tested with the bow and lean test. You can do while the patient on a wheelchair or while the patient on sitting. So you just you bring the head 30 degree down, then you wait and see, then in the neutral position, and then head extension, and see if the nystagmus it changes its direction. There is an important point. When you examine, you do a positional testing, especially for the horizontal canal, you have to wait in the middle. Why? What's, what's the ideal way to do? To either bring the head to the right, 
then you bring the head to the left or bring the head to the right, then wait in the center, then go to the left. It's, it's better to wait in the neutral Good. because the Perfect. particles will settle Why? down. Because it's a positioning nystagmus. Because in, uh, for example, in lateral canal, if we patient is sitting and then lies down, that is uh, in the neutral position, the nystagmus is different. And suppose you take the patient from uh, left lateral, suppose to the neutral position, in the same patient you can get different direction of nystagmus. So it's a positioning nystagmus. That's why the dire direction will change as per the previous position. The previous position from which the patient is attaining neutral position is important. If a patient is attaining from sitting, it might be different. And from lateral, it might be different. So it is very important to let the particle settle down and then go for the another uh, position. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. But it's mainly because of the velocity storage mechanism. You read about the storage of, uh, velocity mechanism that it, it is stronger for the horizontal canal. It, it uh, prolongs the vestibular nystagmus. So if you didn't uh, wait in the center, you will get the same direction of nystagmus on the other way. So it's ideally you should wait at least 30 seconds to wait until the velocity storage mechanisms stop working and uh, 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 you can uh, get the reversal phase. So Sir, yes. there seems to be a different reason also. Suppose it is left horizontal canal canalolithiasis. We did the uh, move towards left side. Okay. What the particles which are lying in the middle of the canal now have moved ampulopetally. They will induce a nystagmus which will be uh, excitatory nystagmus. You not we notice the uh, intensity, frequency, etc. I'm talking of without VNG. Let it be without VNG. Mm -hmm. or vi even with VNG. And now, if we immediately without stopping in the center turn the head towards the opposite side, now the particles will be moving 180 degree away from that will be, what I want to say is it will be the stronger flow of the endolymph which will clear, create a more stronger nystagmus on the other side and then it will become confusing for us to decide the side of the uh, involved, involved canal. That's a good point as well, thank you. So uh, as a rule, you wait in the middle. Uh, well, up to kinetic uh, stimulation. Uh, so uh, for those doing regular VNG testing, uh, what is the most significant value of doing optokinetic test? Uh, there are two things. One is uh, discomfort on optokinetic stimulation is very common in vestibular migraine. Mm -hmm. And second I find is in acute unilateral vestibulopathy, the directional preponderance on one side indicates, for example, the stimulus is moving from left to right, there will be left beating nystagmus. And if the stimulus is moving from uh, right to left, there is right beating. So if a patient has gain more on one side, more likely I expect that he is going to have a spontaneous nystagmus in that direction, and he is going to have unilateral vestibulopathy on the other side, that is slow phase, towards the slow phase. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. I fully agree with you. So uh, we'll go through a few tips about the optokinetic. There is two ways to do the optokinetic test, either uh, look or stir. So look, you ask the patient to follow the uh, stimuli or the lines. He can count or follow the stimuli. So actually, this is will test uh, the pursuit system. So you will have these responses will be a combination of smooth pursuit and saccade, smooth pursuit and saccade. Stair, this is to test the optokinetic reflex, uh, which uses the peripheral retina, and the patient shouldn't just be staring uh, without doing anything. Uh, this is to test the optokinetic reflex. Uh, so be careful. Um, sometimes it's far to separate, but the ideal optokinetic test is to do the steering. Don't uh, let the patient to count and not to follow, it's just to steer in the center. It's a reflex. The patient shouldn't do any intentional or voluntary things. It's just a reflex, and it's a subconscious reflex. It should happen subconsciously. So this is the first point. Second, the effect of velocity. Um, uh, the test sensitivity improves if we go. So like, I don't use the 10 degree test of flow sensitivity. I use the 20 and I'm asking 
to add uh, more velocity options because they found that if you increase the velocity, uh, yeah, the test become more sensitive. Uh, uh, reverse it pattern. If you have a patient with congenital nystagmus, so his optokinetic responses will be on the opposite uh, direction from uh, the normal or from the expected. Uh, this risk traces. If you find too much irregularity, uh, that comes sometimes with the central uh, with the central lesion. Same like saccadic bursus or this one, it can show also on the optokinetic. You you have a very dysrhythmic and uh, regular uh, responses. Uh, optokinetic uh, uh, response can be affected by nystagmus, uh, abnormalities in the saccade and the smooth bursus. So what is the most constant uh, and significant finding? In our experience, I agree with uh, Vishal, that is uh, the discomfort and the visual motion sensitivity which occurs with migraineous patient. This is maybe the most constant finding I've seen. Uh, vestibular migraine or migraineous vertigo is the second most common cause of vertigo in our database. So most of those migraines really, they got very upset, they got annoyed, they feel dizzy, they feel discomfort, they complain. Uh, this is, we consider it some uh, evidence for visual motion sensitivity, which is one of the characteristics of the vestibular migraine. So now I believe I consider it a sign which uh, uh, it helped in the diagnosis. Yes, uh, in optokinetic gain asymmetry is important, and uh, yes, in any cases with unilateral vestibular loss uh, of central or peripheral origin, it can give you a gain asymmetry. So now we'll go for the caloric testing. Uh, I'm not a big fan personally with the caloric test, but still it's uh, important. How did we know that caloric test is very low frequency if you are a stimulus? Just uh, historical. It's always written in the box that says 0.3 uh, 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 hertz frequency. You know from where that number came? Simply, it came uh, from the duration of the caloric response. So they found that the maximum duration of caloric response is 180 seconds, three minutes. So they uh, speculated that it gives, it's like a sinusoidal function with one half cycle is 180 seconds. So they, to calculate the frequency, they divided one by the 180 seconds. So that's why from came, came the number, why they know it's a very low frequency, uh, vestibular stimulus. Um, water versus air, definitely uh, air is less efficient stimulus, uh, and uh, water is more reliable uh, test uh, in caloric stimulation. Mini ice caloric test, I love that test. Uh, I can see it is uh, more easily to control the stimulus, uh, takes a shorter time, uh, more reliable test results. That's my uh, personal experience. Mental tasking is mandatory. You know what happened if you do a caloric testing to a comatose the patient? What kind of response you expect? You did caloric stimulation uh, in a comatose the patient. You will get nystagmus? Yes, Vishal. Uh, it depends on what uh, type of coma that patient is suffering. If the patient is suffering from brainstem coma. Uh, not, a, not a brainstem. Brainstem yeah. is intact. Yeah. In only slow phase will be seen. The fast component will be absent. How it looks like? The slow yeah, component, if this is stimulated, yeah, suppose yeah. left. What, how it looks like? There is nystagmus or no? There is no nystagmus. Yes, it's just a deviation of yeah. the eye, drift of the eye, um, drift of the eye towards the stimulation side. So just you have a drifting of the eyes, no fast phase component, which is the saccades. Saccades needs the cortex, conscious cortex, to be generated. So in comatose, the patient only you get a drift drifting of the eyes with the caloric stimulation. So uh, during the clinical testing, if you want nystagmus, you have to keep the uh, mental alerting. It's very important. I do a mental task, count uh, reversibly 197, 94, or just another mental task. But if the patient 
uh, not more concentrating, drowsy, or not, uh, not alert enough, you get a very weak, very weak response, or very weak nystagmus. Uh, prone caloric test, when you use a prone caloric test, Simply, if you do ice caloric test, if you have a spontaneous nystagmus and uh, you want to know if there is uh, some response uh, from uh, that side or no, uh, you, you didn't get a response with uh, many ice caloric test, it simply brings the patient in the prone position. We test the caloric in the supine position, so that's why the cold stimulus will make inhibition. But if you put the patient in the uh, prone position, it will become excitatory position. And as we know, semicircular canals always respond more to the excitation rather than the inhibition. So it is some sort, uh, we use it with the same, you do many ice caloric tests in the subines and you get no response, just to turn the patient on the, his face, on the prone position. And they see, if, if you get a response, that means there's still some residual function in this side. Very rarely uh, we do, but we did few cases. So the limitation of caloric test, it's not a direct vestibular test. It's easily affected by the heat transmission mechanisms. So if you have a really, very well aerated mastoid, it uh, compromises the heat flow. Uh, do better if the sclerotic mastoid. So it's actually not, not, not a pure vestibular testing, uh, that's a big uh, major limitation. Can be affected by the technique of irrigation, efficiency of irrigation, efficiency of uh, temperature control, uh, mental alertness of the tested subject. Uh, so it has some limitations. Sometimes it induces, uh, it induces vomiting and the nausea and it's uh, not very well tolerated. So those are the limitations of caloric testing. Uh, one more point that is, uh, regarding the caloric test in Meniere's disease. Because that's again uh, uh, clinical popularity, the dissociation between the t uh, results of caloric testing and the video head impulse test, especially in Meniere's disease. And finally, the most uh, uh, working uh, explanation for this dissociation is that is, with the endolymphatic hydrops, the dilated lateral canal uh, become not suitable to do uh, the convection currents. So the heat transmission uh, mechanism got affected by the dilatation. And they did a computer model and some studies, they found that is if the canal is good dilated, it will not generate the convection current uh, in the regular way. That's why caloric stimulation is not enough. So it's not a matter of loss of function, it's a rather uh, mechanical changes and heat transmission uh, changes because of the endolymphatic dilatation or uh, because of the dilatation of the lateral semicircular canals. That's why in video head impulse you get the function normal, but with caloric test uh, you get a weaker response or abnormal response. So this is could be used as a pathognomonic sign for Meniere's disease. You have a normal video head impulse, then you have a caloric weakness on the uh, affected uh, ear. So the caloric weakness in this condition is mainly because of the heat transmission mechanism it changes. So last is a slide about the magnetic stimulation. They use this, the seven Tesla MRI, um, a work done by the John Hopkins group. Um, it's used to test a kind of vestibular asymmetry, like the other provocative test, the heat shaking, the vibration induced. Um, this is the last question in this. I want you to think um, it always gives a horizontal nystagmus. And also cases of vertebral buzzer insufficiency. In most of the cases, they give uh, uh, horizontal nystagmus. Also, most of the cases of Meniere's disease, they give uh, horizontal nystagmus. So do you have explanation for this? Yeah. Yes. Uh, if all the canals are stimulated on one side, the resultant effect of the uh, effect on the extraocular movement is horizontal because the other component gets cancelled with each other. Excellent, Dr. Vishal. Yes, that's correct. Uh, just simply any condition which causes uh, simultaneous 
stimulation of the three canals or simultaneous inhibition of the three sensory canals will generate a net sum of horizontal nystagmus. Because if you stimulate the vertical canal and the uh, uh, interior canal simultaneously, the vertical components will, can will cancel each other, but remain the torsional components. So any kind of condition which causes either stimulation of the uh, simultaneous stimulation of the three canals or simultaneous inhibition uh, like the magnetic stimulation or simultaneous inhibition of the three semicircular canals, you got a horizontal uh, rotatory nystagmus, horizontal component with the torsional component. Thank you.